Welcome everyone. I'm Greta Essig and I manage the Andrew Carnegie Fellows Program at Carnegie Corporation of New York. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our forum on how we can take urgent, responsible, and just actions to tackle the climate crisis. During the next hour, we will discuss the complex considerations around current climate solutions, looking at what's working, as well as some of the hidden costs. Before we get started, a little background. Since its inception, the Fellows Program has awarded 216 fellowships, representing 43 million in support for these fields. The fellowship was created in 2015 by our past president, Vartan Gregorian, who died last spring. While we miss Vartan dearly, we are excited that Louise Richardson will join the corporation as president in January 2023, at the end of her term as the head of University of Oxford. Richardson has been a trustee of the foundation since 2013 and has served on the jury for the fellows program since 2016. We are delighted that the foundation's next president is known for her commitment to scholarship in the social sciences and humanities. We encourage you to learn more about our fellows and their research projects on our website at carnegie.org slash ACF. If you have your smartphone handy, scan the QR code on your screen to link to the program page. We launched the Fellows Forum series last year to highlight the contributions of our fellows whose scholarly research addresses important issues confronting our society. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sister institutions for partnering with us in co-sponsoring today's event, Carnegie Institution for Science and Carnegie Mellon University. During today's discussion, we invite you to share your thoughts online using the hashtag Carnegie Fellows. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's forum, Justin Warland. Justin is a senior correspondent for Time, covering climate change and the intersection of policy, politics, and society. Last month, he attended the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, where he interviewed everyone from heads of state to private sector leaders. Thank you for moderating today, Justin. Well, thank you, Greta. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, after reporting from COP26 last month, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to continue the discussion with all of you and with everyone in the audience. Uh, you know, as anyone who's been to COP surely knows, it's a, a wild experience, a, a UN meeting that's a mix of a trade show and diplomatic talks, and then you throw in celebrities and activists, and it's really unique. And so just to start us off, I have a couple of observations from my experience there. And, and one is that this COP really began with a lot of enthusiasm from uh, commitments that private sector leaders, that government officials made on the first couple days of the COP. We saw commitments around finance, around uh, ending illegal deforestation, around uh, capping methane emissions, the list goes on. Uh, and then this, the, then and then over the course of, of of the two weeks, I think a lot of that enthusiasm enthusiasm either faded or or became a lot more complicated as we saw a lot of underlying tensions really uh, come to the fore. Uh, and so by the end of it, the last sort of closing session around the diplomatic talks that um, you know led to the the, the Glasgow uh, Pact, the the final outcome of the of the uh, meeting. Uh, had you know parties, a country stepping up and expressing dissatisfaction at the way in which the proceedings had gone and, and, and the final outcome and what it looked like to the point where Alak Sharma, who was leading the discussions, uh, was holding back tears. And so I think this sort of is representative of where we are uh, really talking about climate, where there's enthusiasm and acknowledgement that we all need to move forward. Um, but there was a lot of tension about what does that pathway look like uh, how should we all be working together and, and just uh, a need and, and, a, and a recognition that there needs to be some outcome, but a lot of uh, uh, tension about what that should look like. And so that that's sort of my opening observation coming from COP. Today, I'm, I'm joined by four Andrew Carnegie fellows, all noted scholars specializing in different aspects of climate change. And we're going to look together uh, at some of the solutions uh, to address climate change, in a way that is both responsible uh, and just. So let's now welcome Michael Greenstone, uh, Paulina Jarmillo, Sakina Jena, and Thea Rio Francos. Uh, 
Dr. Michael Greenstone is the Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor in Economics and the Director of the Becker Friedman Institute and the Interdisciplinary Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. Previously, he served as the Chief Economist for President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, where he helped the federal government calculate carbon's cost to society. His Andrew Carnegie Fellowship will support the development of new empirically, empirically grounded approaches to estimating the costs of, uh, uh, and impacts of climate change. Uh, Dr. Paulina Jaramillo is the professor, is professor of engineering and public policy and co-director of Green Design, the Green Design Institute at the Carnegie Mellon University. Her research explores the social, economic, and environmental implications of energy consumption and the challenges of pursuing climate mitigation in the global south. Her Andrew Carnegie Fellowship will examine potential scenarios for developing sustainable uh, and modern energy systems in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where more than 600 people lack access to electricity. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sakina Jana is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research explores the intersection of international trade and environmental policies, global climate governance, and most recently, a governance of climate engineering technologies. Her Carnegie Fellowship uh, folk, uh, project focused on the efficacy and potential social impacts of solar geoengineering technologies including the development of theoretically informed governance recommendations about their development. Um, and I just want to uh, uh, correct my previous pronunciation, uh, Dr. Uh, Thea, Thea uh, and, and please correct me if I got that wrong, but I uh, correct me because I know I said it wrong before. Uh, Rio Francos is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Providence College. Her work uh, focuses on resource extraction, green technology, social movements, and the left in Latin America. Her Andrew Carnegie Fellowship project explores the environmental and social costs associated with the production of lithium batteries, uh, which are of course essential to electric vehicles, wind and solar uh, energy storage, and the transition to clean energy. She also looks at the implications for geopolitics and the global economy. Apologies again uh, for for the name, uh, Ms. Hap. Thanks for having me. Okay, wait, what's that? I said thanks for having me. Okay, we are pleased. To, yes, <laughs> great. We are pleased to welcome our audience and encourage viewers viewers to post your comments on Facebook and YouTube. Tweet the forum using the hashtag hashtag Carnegie Fellows. And then we'll be answering audience questions that were submitted during registration toward the end of the conversation. Um, so with that, I'm going to just give us a little bit of an overview. We're going to talk uh, about three areas of interest, beginning with the COP conference. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of the current challenges to climate action. And then finally, we'll conclude with what lies ahead for these issues. Uh, I'm going to direct specific, some specific questions to each of you, and then we're going to talk, you know, have some group questions uh, where uh, everyone will hopefully participate. So uh, for Sakina, let's, let's start with you. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the history of recent international climate discussions, including the 2015 Paris talks that led to the Paris Agreement, and then the progress that was made at COP26. Sure, thanks for that question, Justin. Um, there's a lot to say about the history of global climate politics, um, but I think probably the most important thing to note to really understand the nature of contemporary politics has to do with the, how the Paris Agreement is structured. Um, and critically important is that under the Paris Agreement, countries agreed to set an overarching goal, right, a temperature target to keep global temperatures below two degrees. But the way that countries work together to ensure that those goals are met is done pretty independently. So countries have very little opportunity to um, collaborate with one another to ensure that in the aggregate, that the actions that they take domestically actually get us to that, to that Paris target. Um, so, you know, against that backdrop, um, I think there's three areas of what I would consider measured progress from COP26. Um, the first is that there was a general recognition and a widespread recognition 
that what countries were agree have agreed to do domestically through what are called nationally determined contributions or NDCs was insufficient when put in the aggregate to get us to what the t Paris Agreement actually um, uh, Paris Agreement temperature targets are. So, in light of that. There was a strong push for countries to ratchet up their um, NDC commitments in the next year, which is on a much tighter time frame than what we had expected. So we'd expected to see that happen in the next five years or every five years. But um, in light of this, what we call the ambition gaps or this gap between what the Paris Agreement um, seeks to do and what countries are agreeing to do to actually get to that target, um, countries agreed to sort of speed that up again. The second piece that I think is notable um, and again, I would characterize it as measured progress has to do with finance. Um, so although developed countries had initially committed to, to raise $100 billion per year for um, funding to, uh, mitigation and adaptation in developing countries, and they fell short of that goal, um, the, they were supposed to, to get to that, that target by 2020, um, they agreed in, Paris, in uh, Glasgow to continue talking about it. So that's something, and that was a that was a measured win, I would say, for some of the developing countries to keep that on the agenda. And then the third thing that I would highlight from from COP26 was that for the very first time in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we saw the um, a discussion of fossil fuel subsidies come into come onto the table. And although the language was watered down at the last minute and it's and it leaves a lot of um, wiggle room for what it actually is gonna mean in practice, we saw for the first time the UNFCCC call for a phasing down of fossil fuel subsidies, which could, if taken seriously and implemented um, seriously at the domestic level, could have pretty long tail of impact. Well, thank you for that. That's uh, a great way to start. I wanna, I wanna pick And, uh, temperature rise, and, and this, uh, according to the organizers, the primary goal was to try, this conference was to try to find ways to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And so, Plina, I just, I just want to ask, is it, is it still possible to achieve that target? And what is the greatest challenge to uh, reaching that goal? Uh, thanks, Justin, and thanks, everyone, for participating in the panel. Um, so the target of reaching or limiting warming to 1.5 degrees um, Celsius requires, according to all of the scenarios or all of the integrated assessment scenarios, requires reaching net zero CO2 emissions by the 2050 um, in the most ambitious. It could go, it could, it could be delayed maybe to the 2060, but realistically, we're talking about net zero global CO2 emissions by 2050. Um, and so technically, you're asking me if it's possible. Technically, it's possible. The scenarios, the analysis still shows that there are pathways that could, um, could lead us to that, to that point, to that target, um, that there are technologies that can help us get there. Um, I think the question is more like realistically in the real world, will we get there? Um, and I think um, the NDC, the nationally determined contribution gaps um, are, are um, somewhat depressing. We're not, it, we're not making as much progress as we need to. We're not making progress as fast as we need to. Uh, because reaching 20 uh, net zero CO2 by 2050, uh, we're talking about eliminating all of the CO2 emissions and avoiding any new sources of emissions. And so the longer we take to start on that path, the harder it's going to get to, the, the harder it's going to get to reach the, the target. So as an engineer, because my background is in engineering, I can say that the technologies are there and the pathways are there. Um, I think the question of whether we can is more on the social systems and political systems side of things. Right. Well, that really, as a perfect segue, I mean, you, you make this point, technical possibility is different from the sort of political challenges. And so, uh, uh, Thea, Thea, I, I want to ask you uh, about those political obstacles. What do you see as the key political obstacles to rapid decarbonization, decarbonization in the U.S. and globally? And how did you see that play out at COP? 
Yeah, so this is a great question and perhaps the, the key question in many ways. Um, no, I, I would still highlight the role of the fossil fuel industry. We've seen a real evolution in how the fossil fuel industry has sought to influence climate policies, but that doesn't mean that they're not still quite powerful and present. Um, in fact, as many journalists pointed out, if you took together all of the representatives of fossil fuel entities at COP26, they would have been the largest delegation, larger than any country delegation. So fossil fuel power is still influencing climate policy. As I've noted, though, there's been a shift, and that shift has been away from outright denial, but towards something that is equally as dangerous and pernicious, which is an emphasis on delay um, that results in, in what my co-panelists have emphasized, which is reduced ambitions on the part of national governments you know, that hold the key levers of, of uh, decarbonization. And we also likewise see an approach that comes partly from fossil fuel lobbying, as well as from other economic sectors, on technological fixes like carbon capture, rather than what we need, which is outright supply side restrictions that keep coal, gas, and oil in the ground. And I guess, you know, to sort of wrap up and, and get to the other piece of your question, we also see as a result of this influence, as well as the influence of other powerful actors, um, not enough emphasis on the broader social and economic transformation that is necessary both to address the climate crisis and also to simultaneously lift up the material conditions of or ordinary people, which would in turn, I think, make it much more politically feasible to build democratic majorities in favor of climate action. Right. Very uh, important point. I, Michael, I, I want to ask you, you know, as an economist you work on, you've worked on the global cost of carbon. Um, maybe you could just speak a little bit about how COP26 uh, uh, incorporated and addressed uh, this issue. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and it's quite an honor to be participating in this panel with everyone else. I, I guess I wanted to make a slightly start with a, a, a couple high level points. Uh, the first is, and I think if you've tuned into this, you probably kind of already believe it, but the challenge from climate change is real. Uh, the costs are emerging. Uh, the costs are going to be large in some parts of the world, especially, and that, that inequality in damages is a really important feature uh, of climate. But I wanted to point, in, and I guess I'll give my high-level assessment of COP. My high-level assessment of COP was, uh, you know, it's better than if we had nothing, but you know, it certainly is not a uh, very tight path to achieving the kinds of goals uh, that people on this panel have been talking about. But I wanted to point to two things that I think have not received enough attention and are probably uh, worth highlighting. They're related to COP, uh, but maybe not direct outcomes of COP. Uh, the first is there has been an absolutely uh, remarkable reduction in the costs of low carbon energy sources in, in, in the kind of way that was I think impossible to anticipate in 2015, as recently as 2015. And that has unlocked real improvements, uh, I think, in the projections of where we are. And so uh, where we were headed for temperature change in, at the Paris conference in 2015 is very different than where we appear headed now. And that's because of the reductions in the costs uh, of, low, uh, of low carbon uh, fossil fuels, or sorry, low carbon energy sources. Uh, and I think there's nothing more important than continuing to try and drive reductions uh, in those energy sources because ultimately uh, that that's going to make the politics of this easier. The you know the raw problem, the raw political problem is uh, that uh, the fossil fuels cost less if you don't account for their externalities uh, than the low carbon energy sources, and the de degree to which we can shrink that delta is really important, uh, or maybe even the central issue. Uh, the second thing I would just point uh, point out is the climate scientists finally gave us a big gift last summer uh, in the IPCC report. Uh, and that gift is that their best estimates of how much warming we would get, say, for a doubling of CO2 uh, have changed. Uh, and so while the mean uh, increase in temperatures went up a little bit, they've effectively taken off the really greatly reduce the probability that we're going to see very large changes in temperature. Uh, and that's where a lot of the damages are located. And so that has 
uh, I think will greatly, you know, will have a significant impact on reducing our uh, the cost of climate change, uh, our estimates of the cost of climate change, and that's an important gift. So I guess those are two, you know, although I'm a little pessimistic about COP, those are two things to feel good about: uh, the reduction in low carbon energy sources and our improved understanding of uh, climate or changes in temperature for a given change in CO2. Well, okay, I think we're just about ready to wrap this section, but I just want to have one lightning round, have everybody go through and just give a top takeaway from COP. You know, t to my mind, uh, I would say, you know, the, the, the growing uh, uh, and sort of universal recognition of, of the problem, but the uh, trouble actually making commitments with all of the details as you know uh, that that are needed so that would be my my takeaway and i'd love to just go through in the order that we ask questions to hear from each of you so i think that puts me first um i guess the top takeaway takeaways for me are really that the level of ambition needs to increase dramatically um and that developed countries really need to step up and deliver on the finance that they've promised i guess now next um it's similar my 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 sense after the meeting is we're not doing enough still not doing enough need to do more um i hate to be repetitive but i i totally agree that there is just such a glaring gap between how intense pervasive and accelerating the climate crisis is on the one hand and on the other hand the lack of action and the maintenance of of, of the status quo especially in terms of global climate justice is really galling yeah, I, I guess my take, maybe not that dissimilar, is uh, better than nothing uh, and probably glass one third full. <laughs> well, I think it's it's not a bad thing that everybody has a similar uh, takeaway that shows that uh, the, the understanding of it is is uh or there is there is a right way to understand what happened um let, let's move on to understanding the challenges uh to climate climate action uh cop 26 highlighted uh, a number of these critical undercurrents including issues around the human impact of new technologies global energy needs the economic costs of different interventions and i just want to go around and, and hear thoughts on these challenges so we'll start with polina um one of the challenges is that there are a number of hard to uh, decarbonize sectors. Um, and I guess I would just be curious to hear your thoughts. Can you talk about the low cost uh, that you're seeing? So you broke up for a little bit, but I think, yeah, the, the, it's about which are the hard to decarbonize um sectors and i think the easy answer is the easy to decarbonize sectors are power systems and energy systems broadly speaking um the hard to decarbonize sectors include shipping and aviation which are not the largest source of um co2 emissions by any any extent of the imagination but are growing uh and could continue contributing uh, not insignificant amounts and they're hard to decarbonize. Um, the industrial sector, uh, cement manufacturing, steel manufacturing, uh, chemical manufacturing, those are large sources of CO2 emissions. And there has been less progress in identifying and implementing strategies for decarbonizing um, those industrial sectors. And then there's the whole issue of um, emissions from land use, agriculture, and forestry. Um, we know, so it's not a sector that we're trying to decarbonize, but we know deforestation continues to be a challenge and a large source of um, emissions. And we still haven't figured out really how to address that. So those, those I think, require more attention uh, and more discussion and are probably the negotiations around them may be even harder than around energy and the power system. Right. Well, the next question, I want to go to Michael. Uh, you know, we often hear concerns, uh, you know, in the U.S. around the world about the role uh, that climate policy has on the economy. And, and I, I'm curious, how would you say that countries should be thinking about 
uh, you know, balancing concerns around uh, reducing carbon emissions and the impact on economic growth. You touched on this earlier, but hitting this crest question directly. Yeah, I, look, I think uh, one thing that we sometimes forget living in a really rich country is the very sharp trade off that exists uh, and is, you know, very painful for many countries between uh, the need for inexpensive and reliable energy, which the fossil fuels are terrific at providing uh, and uh, avoiding climate damages. And the way that trade off looks to us and rich countries is very different than the way the trade off looks uh, in India or Pakistan or Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, a favorite example of mine is I do a lot of work in the state of Bihar in India. There, the average uh, per capita electricity consumption is about 200 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, in the United States, it's like 13,000. And if you just stop and think about that, the 200 kilowatt hours per year, there's so much human misery uh, under, you know, attached to that 200. That means you can't use cooling devices when it gets hot. It means uh, crops fail. It means people can't do things uh, do things to protect themselves or, or, or to make their lives uh, more comfortable. Uh, and so those costs are very, very real. Uh, and just because the planet wants uh, carbon or you know, the rich countries want carbon emissions to go down, like that does not mean it's going to necessarily be in those countries' interest. And so that's why I think it's super important that there be the kind of financial transfers. If, if it's so important to us, we should be willing to pay for it. Uh, and I think it's also, and this is something that was largely absent in COP and largely absent in global discussions, is uh, everyone wants to kind of take an engineering approach. We should use this technology in this sector and things like that. And yet at the same time, we know that markets are the most effective way to get the cheapest tons uh, possible. Uh, and I, I find it very surprising and disconcerting that there's not a uh, greater reliance or greater promotion of using markets, be it a carbon tax or be it a cap and trade, uh, to get large scale reductions in CO2, both in rich countries uh, and in uh, less wealthy countries. That's, right. the best well, way to, that's the best way to bridge that uh, trade off is basically my view. Right, right. Um, well, well, Thea, I, I, I want to go to you. Uh, a lot of hope around climate mitigation is often pinned on uh, innovative technologies, new technologies, uh, but there are often hidden costs. And so when we talk about green technologies like electric cars, uh, there are our supply chain, what are, what are some of the supply chain challenges, you know, uh, including the mining of lithium and car batteries, which I know is an area of your research? Yeah, so the International Energy Agency terms this a transition from a fuel intensive uh, energy system to a materials intensive energy transition, meaning that instead of getting fuel out from under the ground, we'll be getting increasing amounts of copper, cobalt, nickel, rare earths elements, aluminum, um, lithium, et cetera, and also energy intensive raw materials like steel in order to build the green technologies and infrastructures that are necessary to harness renewable energy. And so this immediately, you know, sort of shows the tension between the impacts of the mining sector, which is one of, if not the most environmentally pernicious sector on earth, also has major so impacts on, on communities, um, uh, on political corruption, on indigenous rights, is often marked by outright violence, lots of human rights allegations in this sector. So this is a sector that's primed to grow as we transition to renewable energy. And it raises this key question for global justice, who will pay the costs and who will get the benefits of the renewable energy transition? And is there a way to make sure that we avoid replicating those localized harms that we associate with the fossil fuel sector um, when we build a renewable um, energy system? And, you know, just to kind of, you know, I know my, my time is short here and there's a lot to say, but um, the way that I would look at this is that there's no question that we need to decarbonize and do so rapidly. The question is, how do we decarbonize? And there are a lot of different choices in terms of policies, technologies, and the material underpinnings of the renewable energy system. Um, and I think ultimately what our goal should be is to reduce the resource intensity, the intensity of new mining of this new renewable energy system as much as possible, and also view it with a holistic understanding 
of social and environmental justice across those supply chains, not just at the end use where we use those renewable energy technologies, but from extraction to manufacturing to logistics, how harms and benefits are distributed globally. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, with a question for Sakina. Your climate research focuses on emerging technology globally, specifically solar geoengineering. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit. This is a big question and we have limited time, but tell us about these emerging technologies. Why are they, why are they controversial and where is this debate headed? Sure. Thanks, Justin. Um, so it, briefly, climate engineering technologies are divided into two baskets, those that are concerned with carbon removal and those that are concerned with, with reflection of, of solar radiation. And, and my work really falls into the latter. So solar geoengineering is a suite of technologies that range from, you know, putting painting rooftops white to really sci-fi stuff like putting mirrors into outer space. Um, most of my work is focused on a particular technology called stratospheric aerosol injection, which is um, geared towards or aims to reflect solar radiation by putting reflective particles into the stratosphere. Um, why is it controversial? Uh, there are many, many reasons. There's a host of really good reasons why solar geoengineering is controversial, ranging um, from the massive uncertainties associated with if we were ever to develop these technologies at scale, what would be the real impact in the world, to moral hazard concerns, which are critically important as well. So the idea is if we turn our attention towards these so-called techno fixes that really don't do anything um, to address the underlying problems, we turn our attention away from what's actually needed to address climate change, which is rapid decarbonization. Um, and then the current debate, just really briefly, is you know, solar geoengineering had been at the fringe of, of climate, mainstream climate change policy and, and science for many, many years. And in the last couple of years, we're really starting to see discussions emerge um, in mainstream forums, including in the, in the IPCC, as well as a National Academies report that came out um, earlier this year, specifically focused on this topic. Well, great. Let's. That's a great way to uh, uh, end this the second block and move on now to the third block. Uh, before we uh, get to questions submitted by the audience, which we will get to uh, shortly, uh, we are going to talk a bit about the future and what is needed to continue to advance climate change as a global priority. Uh, this includes next steps from COP26. Uh, Uh, and so with that, I, I want to start with Thea uh, and ask you, you know, you've been touching on this throughout the course of this conversation, but how does climate change intersect with inequality and injustice? And what do we need to do to make sure that the focus uh, on climate change uh, also helps us uh, achieve global climate justice? Yeah, so there's so many intersections, but let me just go with the broadest one, which is that at every scale, from the global to the national to the local, you have a totally inverse relationship between the groups and communities responsible for the most carbon emissions, whether we talk about historically or we talk about current per capita emissions, and the groups and communities that are most vulnerable to climate harm, right? So that sets this up, sets up climate change as, an, as a justice issue. Those who are paying the costs of, of the climate crisis are opposite from those who have produced the climate crisis. There are also clear parallels with the current, you know, an unfolding global pandemic in, in terms of that deep inequality and the lack of access to climate financing, climate um, technologies that is mirrored in the what some call a vaccine apartheid, right? So this, these inequalities are, are compounding across public health and, and, and climate. Um, you know, I think that that um, in the in globally, I'll add one more piece and then I'll go to the US briefly, um, which is that this relationship between inequality and climate change is really compounded by what I would call a, a crisis in global sovereign debt that afflicts global South countries, that leaves them with really limited fiscal room for maneuver in terms of investments in mitigation and adaptation. Um, and that needs to be addressed by global redistribution and also by lowering and in some cases outright canceling that sovereign debt. Um, let me just go kind of to, to the US or, or you know to national context, which is that one of the key insights for the Green New Deal framing of, of the climate of climate policy for me is that it 
really emphasize that connection between inequality and climate change. And I, we've seen some influence of that framing on the Biden administration, which I think is good. But I think we need to do a lot more before the Democratic Party, you know, is really kind of centering the relationship between improving ordinary folks, working class, communities of color, um, material conditions, and connecting that to the climate crisis so that we don't see this continued supposed trade-off between economic well-being and addressing climate change, but really presenting them as holistically part of the same policy paradigm. Right. Well, Paulina, your research also looks at the equity implications of climate mitigation, particularly the energy needs in the global south. And so I just want to ask sort of broadly, what role should developing countries uh, and, th and countries in the global south play in decarbonization efforts? Yeah, so um, thinking about this question, I think we should we should get rid of the should, what role should countries, developing countries play, but more to how can developing countries participate in decarbonization? I think the should question, this is a collective problem that requires collective solutions. Uh, and so exempting developing countries from from pursuing low carbon pathways is not going to be helpful. Um, and then when we talk about, okay, how do, how, what, how do these countries pursue decarbonization? I think we also have to separate different development countries, developing countries and different regions in the world, right? China and India, um, which are considered developing countries are large emitters. Um, they have it, to support carbon, like the 1.5 degree target. We have to reduce emissions in those countries. African countries are not large sources of emissions. Their, their challenge there is avoiding new emissions. And so that's a very different challenge. Reducing what they're currently emitting and avoiding what they could emit is very different. I think uh, another issue, um, and I work mostly on the context of Africa. And I think something we have to remember is, so Africa, like you mentioned in the introduction, Sub-Saharan Africa, over 600 million people lack access to electricity and 1 billion lack access to clean cooking facilities. And so what's gonna be expensive is meeting, developing the energy systems that provide the services those countries need. Developing those systems to be low carbon, given the economics of low carbon technologies in recent years is not what's expensive. What's expensive is meeting the energy, building the energy systems that they don't have. And I think that that changes, I know I'm over time a little, but I think that, that we have to keep that in mind, that we're building brand new energy systems. What's expensive is building the system, not building it so that it's low carbon. The marginal cost of low carbon is low. And so the negotiations really should be about financing, not whether we remove the responsibility of, of building low carbon systems in developing countries. Right. Well, I, I want to shift gears a little bit. Sakina, uh, you talked about the ambition gap. I believe you talked, somebody talked about the ambition gap earlier. Um, and I want to ask you again about the ambition gap. Uh, first, just to explain it uh, again, why is it important? And, you know, how do we bridge the ambition gap? Thanks, Justin. Yeah, it, it was me. Um, I think in my first my first response, <clears throat> I talked a little bit about it. But just to recap, um, so the ambition gap is the difference between what the Paris Agreement sets forth as an overarching goal, so keeping global temperatures below two degrees above pre-industrial levels, and the aggregate domestic policy responses through nationally determined contributions that countries have um, put on the table to actually to actually meet that overarching goal. And when we when we when we calculate in the aggregate what type of temperature response we might see when we look at all the NDCs that countries have put on the table, there's a big gap. We don't get to we don't we don't get to two degrees yet. So the way that countries have um, committed to closing that gap is through what's called a ratcheting up process. And under the Paris Agreement, they agreed to do that every five years, as I mentioned earlier um, in COP twenty at COP twenty six. Um, there was a strong push to ratchet up even in the coming year, which is faster than expected. Um, and then I think the other panelists have highlighted a variety of ways in which um, countries could go about closing that gap, ranging from sort of creating market mechanisms, like Michael mentioned, to um, Paulina's last last response um, and several several other 
issues related to de rapid decarbonization that Thea mentioned earlier. Um, so in short, it's going to take a constellation of approaches and um, there's no sort of silver bullet solution to doing that. Right, right. Well, to shift gears once more and to... Uh, if you could just talk a little bit in layman's terms about, uh, you know, how it's calculated and how might this concept shift the thinking of people who are wary to act on climate because of the uh, economic costs. Sure. Uh, thanks, Justin. So the idea of the social cost of carbon is it gives you a measure of the damages uh, that are unleashed every time you release a ton of CO2. And just for reference point, uh, the average American is responsible for maybe 16 tons uh, of CO2 per year. Uh, and the way it's calculated is to put an extra ton in, in, in an economic model, put an extra ton into the atmosphere and see what damages uh, emerge in terms of higher rates of mortality, reduced crop yields, uh, a variety of high sea level rise, variety of other things. And what pops out of that is... Uh, two main things that I want to highlight. The first is just the, the large differences in the estimated impacts of climate change. You know, if you're Norway, it's probably on net going to be good uh, because they have these terrible cold winters, same with northern Canada. But there's lots of parts of the world where it's going to be quite bad. Uh, and that's where, unfortunately, most of the people live. Uh, and there's swatches of India and other places that are already hot. Uh, and raising temperatures is just going to have very large impacts. When you put it all together, uh, what my research is demonstrating uh, or finding is that the release of an additional ton of CO2 probably does about $100 to $200 uh, worth of damages, depending on a variety of assumptions that you insert into it. But you can think about that as every ton that I'm responsible, uh, so the average American is responsible for somewhere between 1500 and say $3,000 worth of damages uh, every year. And it really underscores every ton matters. And I think that's a different way of thinking about the climate problem than thinking about achieving net zero by a particular year, uh, but drives home that every ton that we're able to mitigate uh, will produce benefits for our children uh, and our children's children. Right, right. Every ton matters. I like uh, that phrasing. I think it's a smart way to say it. Um, so I just want to do one more lightning round here before we get into audience Q&A. And uh, this is one of my uh, favorite questions. I'm sure others on the panel have gotten this question, get this question all the time uh, in, in various panels. But it's uh, about, you know, what is what, what can individuals do and, and what specifically can the people in our audience do uh, to address climate change. Uh, I'm curious to hear each of your perspectives and maybe we'll just go uh, as you appear on the screen, beginning with uh, uh, Via and uh, moving to Michael, et cetera. Um, I love this question too, because I give a somewhat maybe counterintuitive answer, which is that the most effective thing I think an individual can do is get involved in a group, get involved in climate advocacy and climate justice work in your community, in your country. There's also ways to get involved in global climate justice work. I don't think that this is a problem that admits of individual scale solutions, but it does get pushed forward by individuals joining climate justice work. Um, and there's work to be done everywhere in the world because this is a planetary emergency. Um, so that's what I would suggest to folks that feel moved to, to get involved. Uh, Great. Yes, Michael's next. Yeah, so I think I have two answers. The first is uh, very close to Thea's, uh, which is uh, at the end of the day, in kind of windy and indirect ways, governments really frequent, most of the time, do what people want. Uh, and if, democ if, if people are not pushing uh, uh, for climate to be a priority, governments are not going to make it a priority. And so I think political activism on climate change, if you care about it, uh, is the is probably number one thing to do. Number two, I do think, and I, we all get this question, what can individuals do? And I wanna just come back to every ton matters. Uh, and I think there are reliable ways for people to reduce their carbon footprint in, inexpensively. Uh, and I don't think they're the usual suspects. And in fact, I have started a nonprofit called Climate Vault, uh, 
Climate Vault that uh, provides people an inexpensive way uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, and I think that that can be an important contributor, although I think less important than uh, expressing your voice politically in the political system. Great. Pa Paulina, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so just to build, I guess I was also going to say that we need political action and that means getting involved in the political process. But the other thing just to add then is get involved in education, climate education and climate literacy. It's amazing to me how little people actually know in, in the U.S., which is a well-educated country about climate and and so part of your activism and involvement may be getting involved in education efforts um, so that other people can also engage in political activism and the political process. Great. Should I jump in, Justin? Yes, no, yes, go ahead. Sorry, jump in. Please. So in line with what several others have already said, I think the most effective way for individuals to address climate change is to stop thinking individually and start thinking institutionally. Uh, the, way, the way to create change is to change incentives for behavior through institutions. Um, it's great to buy an electric vehicle, but it's, it's way better to lobby your policymakers to create incentives so everyone can buy an electric vehicle. Um, I also think, just to add um, on what others said, individual action can, can actually create a sense of complacency about the need for systemic change. And if we're going to effectively address this problem, we need widespread systemic change. Great. But um, so with, with that, I, I want to move to the audience Q and A. Uh, you know, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. We'll try to get through as many as we can. These were submitted during registration uh, when people when you all registered for the uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Sakina. Um, you know, in recent years, U.S. trade agreements have moved to include environmental provisions that include penalties uh, for countries that fail to meet commitments. Is this measure working? Uh, I also wonder if you can reflect a bit about the intersection of trade and climate policy more broadly. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a lot of conversation about, uh, uh, you know, taxing carbon at the border, uh, carbon adjustments, et cetera. And I just wonder if you can give us, give the audience a sense of, of what's happening in this space. Sure, I can I can take on some of that, and I think Michael might be well positioned to tackle some of it as well. Um, so most of my work at the intersection of, of international trade and environmental policy has been looking at U.S. preferential trade agreements, bilateral agreements, and most of those agreements, to the extent that they they address environmental issues, really focus on biodiversity um, issues. And in that context, um, you know, there's a lot to say there, uh, but sort of the take home is I think there's there's some kind of shift in incentives and chilling to, to chilling against um kind of it, it helps but it's not it's not a silver bullet so it's not uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't advocate for trade agreements as being sort of a way to address um climate change in isolation but it certainly can be part of the part of the solution um in terms of the way the u.s has addressed climate change in in our bilateral trade agreements we really haven't and that's because fast track authority um, until it expired in July of this earlier this year, um, actually prohibited the U.S. government from including climate change provisions in our trade agreement. So it, we'll we'll see what happens as as um, as that moves forward and if that's ever um, reinitiated. And I think you know, in terms of carbon taxes, I'm guessing Michael is better positioned to to answer that question. I think they're an important part of the solution, but of course, the devil is in the details. And there's you know many countries that are already. Um, using carbon taxes as as part of the solution. M Michael, do you want to chime in at all? Yeah, uh, I think with respect to trade agreements, uh, it's a no brainer. Uh, we shouldn't allow, you know, if we're going to have carbon policy, we shouldn't uh, let people import carbon uh, be it through steel bars or whatever for free. Uh, and so there should be border tariff adjustments. Uh, that That's simple. I think probably the first thing that we need to do, though, at least the United States, is have a clear and full-throated and very transparent uh, climate policy, which we're still kind of feeling our way towards. And so that would be the basis for those kind of border tariff adjustments. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to a different uh, question from the audience here. What, uh, what about success stories, including surprising breakthroughs? What kind of framing 
justice movements. Uh, and we'll start with Thea, and then you know, if others want to chime in, that's great too. Yeah, so um, to go to maybe a more inspiring point, um, there have actually been a lot of recent success stories, and I've been starting to track them, where community coalitions have been able to stop completely fossil fuel infrastructure projects. And I'm talking about everything from pipelines to LNG plants um, that convert gas to liquefy it, usually for export, to gas-fired and coal-fired power plants. And this is around the world, including here in the U.S. So there's been a lot of recent victories. And I think, you know, vastly simplifying, there's some things in common between these victorious uh, campaigns. Oftentimes, a diversity of tactics, everything from engaging in the electoral system to public hearings um, held by regulatory agencies to oftentimes also direct and more militant forms mm -hmm. of action and activism. We also often see broad coalitions, right, that represent labor, community, uh, indigenous groups, um, et cetera, taking part in, in these successful campaigns. And we also see that reflected in intersectional framing that addresses simultaneously social, economic, and environmental issues. And I'll just end by saying that we see these, activi these activists being successful on their own terms, but also because in some cases it's intersecting with the rising cost of capital investment in the fossil fuel sector and the changing economics of fossil fuels, kind of creating an opening for activist campaigns to, to be more successful because oftentimes investors will actually just pull out under sustained pressure. Right. Well, let's let's move to maybe another another question, um, which uh, I'll direct to Paulina, but again, open for anybody. Uh, Given the likelihood of climate conditions getting worse, uh, what do you think about calls to focus as much attention on adaptation as we're currently focused on uh, climate mitigation? So we are committed to climate change already. We're seeing those impacts already. So absolutely, there is a need for investments in adaptation. Um, and I think here we get back to uh, justice and equity problem because adaptation uh, capabilities are very different throughout the world. And so there is now a question of how you allocate um, adaptation funds to the most uh, susceptible countries, which are typically developing countries. And so I think that's absolutely we have to start investing in adaptation. Um, and we have been very slow even in investing in adaptation within the United States, which is crucial, much less investing in adaptation for other countries. And I think that has to accelerate those investments and, and the transfer of, money, of funding for those investments has to accelerate. Great, does it, well, does it, if anyone else wants to chime in on adaptation, that's, that's great. Um, I might actually. Otherwise I'll move to the next question. Sorry, did. May I jump in? Yes, Justin? please. Um, so I think this is actually, it's also important to think about this question in the historical evolution, uh, in the context of the historical evolution of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, where, you know, for many, many years, it was focused exclusively on mitigation. And it was a really hard fought battle um, by the developing countries to bring adaptation onto the agenda and equal with equal attention um, as, as uh, mitigation had. And so I think, you know, that's, it's, it's important to recognize that and also important to recognize that when we think about, as Paulina said, the justice and equity um, context in which those calls are being made, um, they're really pointing to the fact that many of the countries that are facing, that are most climate vulnerable and are facing the most immediate and severe imp impacts in the short term also have contributed least to the problem historically and have the least capacity to adapt. So I think it's absolutely um, critical to, to turn our attention towards adaptation and continue calls to bring adaptation um, and bring it into equal, in, with equal attention as mitigation. Right, right. Well, I, I wanna ask you another question, Sakina, just a very, another audience question, very, very broad, but to take this sort of to 30,000 feet, which is, Broadly, what are the implications of climate action or inaction on foreign policy, and what are the greatest, greater, greatest flashpoints? Um, uh, so we'll start with you, and then uh, maybe uh, go to Thea after that. I might need a minute to think about that. So, if Thea, if you wanted to go first, that would be great. I, I could also. Great. Okay. So, so Thea, and then, and then Paulina, maybe. 
Yeah, and I think our answers will, will be complementary, not the same, because I'm going to go back to my research on so-called critical minerals, which are minerals used by um, the energy transition like lithium and cobalt and nickel and the ones that I mentioned earlier. And I think one interesting shift that we're seeing is that we're going to you know, move away from fossil fuels being a flashpoint for geopolitical conflict and tension and potentially move towards these mining sectors being a flashpoint for um, geopolitical conflict and tension. And we're already seeing that happening in terms of the way the US, the EU and China are kind of interacting around these mineral supply chains. Um, and I find that concerning because as everyone has mentioned today, climate change is a collective action problem and so is the energy transition. And anything that generates conflict is an obstacle to cooperation. So I would kind of just advise folks to be skeptical and critical thinking when you hear leaders say, you know, we need to dominate these supply chains or, you know, kind of raise the stakes of geopolitical conflict around mining, because that is also not good for the local ecosystems and communities affected by mining. Um, but regardless of, of that point, I, I do just think in general that these sectors will become new flashpoints in, in climate related geopolitics. Right. Paul, and I just wanted yeah, to quickly say that climate inaction is a security risk. Um, it, interestingly enough, the U.S. Um, military is more um, worried about climate change than any other actor in the U.S. government. AFRICOM, which is the operation, the military operations of Africa, has identified climate change as a national security threat because climate is a threat multiplier that can lead to conflict. And there's growing research on these. There's some research to suggest that climate factors had, um, uh, had a role in the Syrian conflict. Um, and it's a threat multiplier because when you have um, water droughts and shoot, uh, food shortages and losses of jobs, that is fuel for instability and violence. And so, Climate inaction also is a geopolitical and a, and a national security risk. Great. Well, um, I okay. policies are needed to trigger a rapid energy transition in the U.S. and what can be done to support. Uh, to ensure public support for such a transition. And then I just want to also mention the infrastructure conversation happening in Washington and how does that play into this? So Michael, if you just have very brief thoughts because we're almost at time. Yeah, I, I think, look, there's two problems uh, with climate change. One, when you pollute uh, CO2 in the air, it's basically free in most parts of the world. Uh, so we have an easy blackboard solution to that. That should be, uh, we should tax it, we should price it, you should have to pay a penalty for it. Uh, most parts of the world, including the United States, are having a hard time doing that. The second problem we have is that the fossil fuels continue to be cheaper and we need more R&D on low carbon energy sources. And that could change the fundamental economics and drive massive uh, changes around the world if we could get that flipped. So I'd like to think, view all policies through, are they addressing problem one or problem two? And what I'm troubled by is, and partially in the infrastructure bill and in general discussions is, too often we get seduced by policies that are not directly about number one or number two. That is, they don't tax and they don't do anything uh, to reduce uh, the long run cost of low carbon fuels. And so until we get narrowly focused on that and narrowly focused on tons, I think this is gonna continue to be a big problem. We'll be continuing to have panel discussions like this. Okay, and so Paulina. very quickly, yeah, very quickly, a carbon tax is not enough. A carbon tax that is politically feasible will not get us to the carbonization levels we need. Because the um, carbon, like the cost I, I, has I, I, a current I, I, technology. It is not, uh, I understand that if you have $40 carbon tax, or $50 carbon tax, or $60 carbon tax is not going to get us to net zero. Uh, I don't think that's the right question. Uh, because a going for policies that cost $300 a ton is also not going to get us uh, to net zero. I think the question is, how can we get the most tons least expensively? Uh, and we, I, for some reason, we have a very hard time focusing the, uh, the challenge like that. And until we do, I think 
we're going to be chasing kind of long shot bank shots, things like that. And uh, we need to stay laser focused on tons, tons, tons. That's my view. Well, okay, great. I, that, it's a, a, an interesting note to end on, uh, and I think an interesting and important debate. Um, thank you uh, to all of the fellows, Michael Greenstone, Paulina Jaramillo, Sakina Gina, uh, Gina and uh, uh, Thea, Thea Rio Francos. Um, it's been great to hear from all of you, and I appreciate all of the work that you're doing, which informs the work that uh, I do and, and the entire conversation. So I, I'm just incredibly grateful. Um, on behalf of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, I want to give special thanks to the partners who co-sponsored today's forum, uh, Carnegie Institution for Science and Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and a few programming notes for our audience. You can visit Carnegie dot uh, org slash acf to learn more about the andrew carnegie fellow pro, fe, excuse me our andrew carnegie fellows program scholarly research and future live stream events you're also invited to stay in touch by signing up for the foundation's newsletter at carnegie.org slash sign up uh, i'm justin Moreland, senior correspondent at time covering climate change you can follow my reporting on twitter at justin Moreland. Uh, thank you again to everyone for uh, logging in today. I encourage you to continue following uh, the Andrew Carnegie Fellows Forum. Uh, and in the meantime, the corporation urges you to stay in touch via Twitter at Carnegie Corp. Uh, thank you again. <laughs>